Welcome to the Chintina New Gold Rush Breakfast. I'm so happy to see so many of you here so early, bright and early here today. I'd like to first acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I would also like to acknowledge that many of us, including myself, work on the vibrant traditional territories of the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. Now, I would like to introduce you to your host, Michael Gray, who is a partner at Agentis Capital. Welcome, Michael. Well, we're living in interesting times. And this morning, I, I think you're going to have a very insightful and dynamic uh, session. Uh, it's, uh, there's going to be four stocks profiled. Um, and we're going to have a change up a little bit from the format that was done at Roundup and PDAC. So essentially, it's all about the renaissance of this granite-hosted mega gold province that's really vastly underexplored in uh, the Yukon, Alaska, and the Northwest Territories. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Quentin Henne because he was there with all four companies pretty early days, uh, speaking to the narrative of the potential. So uh, I, I think it's worth acknowledging him. So I'm an equity analyst at Agentis Capital. Uh, and a, the pleasure of moderating this session. Uh, for those that don't know Agentis Capital, we're an international research and advisory firm, uh, 45 employees, uh, four offices globally. Partners are here, uh, David Stevens, Scott Speed, and, uh, and all of our staff here. Uh, so we're really excited to be here. So over the next 90 minutes or so, uh, we're gonna have this exciting picture of the uh, new Tintina Gold Belt portrayed for you. We're gonna have a fireside chat at the, at the front just to get going. And then we're gonna have pitches by the companies. They're gonna be about uh, five to eight minutes long. Uh, and then Q&A, both from me and the audience. So get ready with some questions. I've already tagged a few people expecting questions. Mick, thank you, Ben, thank you. Full disclosure, Agentis uh, does provide independent research coverage to Snowline Gold. It'll be uh, Tectonic, followed by Rakla, then Banyan, and Snowline. And a lot of the uh, questions I'm gonna direct will be a little bit driven by the audience here. So maybe a show of hands for who's technical. Okay, and then financial. Okay, so there's, a, there's a, probably a 70 to 30 ratio. So we'll, we'll govern it accordingly. Certainly want this to be value add. So ask those, uh, those incisive questions. I also wanna thank uh, Manuel and Jordi of the Fairmont uh, Waterfront, they've been very helpful and thank you in advance for putting this together. Maybe a round of applause, including the breakfast. <clears throat> okay, to set the stage, um, I've got about seven slides here. And this is, we're gonna keep things relatively straightforward, but between Alaska on the uh, uh, far left through to the Yukon and then to the Northwest Territories, this is what we're branding as the new Tintina Gold Belt. If you look at the uh, number of deposits, uh, the mines are in, in uh, the pickaxes there, and then the key deposits in yellow, along with uh, the tombstone belt, kind of the sub-complex uh, sub, uh, uh, within it in kind of salmon color, okay, where a lot of the uh, talks are gonna be based on. <clears throat> look at the endowment. Fort Knox uh, started in 1997 at a pretty low gold price, and it was really leveraged by infrastructure. So that was able to come into production, and look at that now, it's 13 million ounces. It's recently pivoted to more of a heat bleach, uh, but it's incredible what's happened to Fort Knox. Uh, Pogo, 12 million ounces, kind of a derivative of this intrusive related gold uh, system, but high grade, half ounce, uh, underground, and very, very thick, flat quartz veins. And then, I don't know if John McConnell's in the crowd today, but uh, congratulations, getting Eagle Mine up and running during the pandemic, not easy to do. Uh, commercial production in 2020, and then overall endowment, past production, and current resources uh, pushing eight million ounces. And all of these have, have mine lies heading towards 2030. So very impressive. Just wanna touch on the grades, and if you look at the, uh, on the far left, the Fort Knox reserve grade was 0.8. All milling, blue is milling, uh, dark blue, light is heap leach, and then hatched is, we'll see what happens. 
So that was a milling operation and at, at a reasonably low gold price under 400 bucks an ounce. And again, it was that infrastructure that really drove that. As you can see, the next over to the right, it then pivoted to become more and more a heap leach operation. They were able to bring the reserve grade down to 0.33. The Eagle Reserve, I've been there a couple of times to the mine, uh, at 0.67, entirely heap leach, um, and it leaches very well for a northern heap leach. Oral Mac, which you'll hear about today, uh, 0.61, and it's in a work in progress. Uh, Tara's going to give us a really good update, and I know she's doing a lot of metallurgical work. And finally, on the right side is the Agentis estimate of what Snowline has. An analysts are allowed to make estimates. Uh, it's a little pit constrained estimate, and we're coming up with just under 1.3 grams uh, per ton in that discovery. Uh, this is Dr. Craig Hart's. Um, cross-section cartoon of the anatomy of the typical reduced intrusive uh, gold system. And uh, we won't get into a huge amount of detail, but this is important because we're talking about erosional levels. So up in the top, in this case, I'm going to make it sediments. Uh, in yellow, the Hornfelds region where the sediments get baked by the intrusion. And then moving down into the top of the intrusion, the purple is that cupola, which seems to be very, very special, especially in, in the case of Snowline and then into the pinker color where you're getting into the guts of the pluton. These have small footprints. They're only about uh, kilometer by kilometer typically, and you can see at depth there's a, a larger uh, batholith that's spitting out these um, smaller intrusives up to surface, very attenuated. So some people could argue with these erosional levels, but we've got some of this in our research when we, when we initiated, and essentially uh, we think that Oromac, Banyan's asset, is, I think everyone's in agreement, it's still in the sediments, it's in the Hornfelds, and the intrusive is still to depth. There's lots of smoking gun information on that. We'll get into that. Uh, Valley, Fort Knox, Eagle, and potentially Astro, they seem to be kind of at the same level. Uh, that could be a debate. I know Craig Hart's in the room and, and maybe chimes in on some of his thoughts in the Q&A. Craig, I'm, I'm hoping you're still in the room. Okay, he might, have, he might have left. Oh, there he is. Good. And then flat. Uh, Tony may challenge me on this level, but I think it's a work in progress to understand its level um, out, out in Alaska. So a couple of features just to help with the uh, narrative here and to understand these systems. Listen for some of these things as the talks get presented. Uh, placer trails, gold mining placer trails, these typically have uh, visible gold or some sort of uh, gold associated with them that's manifest in placer trails. Okay. The uh, effectiveness of stream sediment geochem is, is very powerful in terms of detecting these uh, basins where you may have permissive um, uh, gold systems related to these intrusions, and soil geochem is also very effective. Reduced intrusions, again, relatively small footprints. I mean, it, it varies, uh, but they happen to be a long gate depending on the structure, and multi-phase intermediate to felsic intrusions. Uh, Hornfell's uh, country rock, uh, you know, and I'm putting in the geochemical vectors. If you do have uh, bismuth and tellurium, you're probably very proximal. So that might be a really good thing in the case of being in the Hornfell's rocks. You've got bismuth and tellurium. You might be sitting right on top of the intrusion. At least that's one way to look at it. And a lot of these insights are from discussions with uh, Dr. Craig Hart and other company reps vis-a-vis uh, -vis our coverage. Sheeted quartz veins. Uh, when we initiated on Snowline, uh, it was partly on the back of getting up to site because Craig Hart um, had said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. That was in a news release. That was worth $50 million in my, in my book uh, to be, for someone with that credibility to say that. The entire market didn't maybe understand that, but being a, the global expert on these type of deposits and chairman of Snowline, that really drove me up very quickly. Uh, Bismuth and tellurium, plus or minus tungsten, you're going to hear a lot about that. I, I've mentioned the lateral and vertical zonation. You tend to have the, um, the bismuth and tellurium being, being very proximal. And then geophysical methods, uh, ZTEM, resistivity, MAG, lows and highs. The companies will illuminate those. Uh, and then, and then uh, I think more recently, Lampfer Dykes, uh, certainly getting an appreciation, uh, you know, certainly on, on some projects at least, I think uh, the Eagle Mine and, and uh, RC uh, Sitkins project, those are, are coming into play as being quite important. 
Um, I put in this chart, and uh, apologies to Tony for leaving out Alaska in this particular chart, but I think it applies to, to Alaska as well. This is the Yukon stock performance of all the companies that were in the property tours this summer. And you can see that, you know, maybe it's partly seasonality, but this is a pretty good trade to be in, in terms of uh, versus the GDXJ, certainly outperformed gold. It was up 25% just uh, a few weeks ago, but whether it was the property tour, whether it was all the financings, where it was all the results coming out, uh, this was a pretty uh, good year to date return in a very, very tough market. Uh, these are the four companies that are going to be presenting, um, <clears throat> with, starting with Tectonic on the, on the left, and then we're going to have Rakla, uh, Tectonic Alaska, uh, Rakla in, in the Northwest Territories, then Banyan uh, right in that Mayo district, and then uh, Snowline with the Rogue Project. Yeah, that, I, think, uh, I think we're going to invite the CEOs and presenters up to stage now. So uh, uh, you know, join me in welcoming... Um, our company wraps up the stage. So we're going to have a brief fireside chat just to get going. Uh, I know last time when I was watching the, the replay, uh, some of the individuals didn't get to speak for 50 minutes. And I think it's so important as a presenter to actually get out of the gate and say something like that. So uh, why, don't, why don't we go down the line here? Just who you are, your background, very briefly and concisely, technical or non-technical financial, and just a little bit of color on background, and we'll just take you know 30 seconds each or so, and, and bang, bang, bang. Starting with Tony. All right, Tony Rada, President and CEO, I'm one of the founders of Tectonic Metals, Inc. Um, I sort of cut my teeth in the industry by making an investment at the age of 21. It was 1995. I bought a junior mining stock for the first time. First stock ever was, was mining. And I thought it was pretty smart, made some money. BreeX happened, proved that I was quite dumb. And uh, I wrote off the space. And then my foray back into the mining space was in 2005 with a company called Kamenak Gold Corporation. Right. We were private. I was the second hire. And uh, we took that from $3 million, ounce, sorry, $3 million market cap to $520 million in 11 years. And uh, obviously a team effort. And I cut my teeth learning geology by going on the field, which was quite uh, foreign for a person that started out as an IR to do that. So I was quite fortunate that our CEO was very much uh, integrative in the sense like, hey, you want to go in the field? And I just uh, lapped it up. So Excellent. I, yeah. uh, Scott Castellone, VPX Rackla. VPX Rackla, uh, interesting your story. Yeah. My introduction to the mining sector was when the Hunt brothers were driving the price of silver up. My <laughs> mother told me to buy silver as an investment. I bought it at $21 an ounce, and I think I sold it for a can of Coke. <laughs> uh, I'm a geologist. Uh, I've been in the industry for many years, 37-ish, I think, now, and joined Rackla in January, <clears throat> having previously uh, been with the Yukon Geological Survey for eight years. Tara, uh, CEO of Banyan. Present CEO of Banyan, yes, I've been here since 2016. Before that, uh, I grew up, my father's a PhD geologist, out doing collecting soil samples and doing exploration, but went into geotechnical engineering because my father told me about this cyclical business that was dangerous, so I thought I could always get a job mm. if I had an engineering degree. But really, I focus more on management, environmental assessment, permitting relationships with First Nations and running companies, a little bit of geology. And Scott, CEO, Scott Burdell, CEO of Snowline? Um, yeah, my background is, uh, that, well, uh, somewhat uh, similar to Terrace in some ways. Grew up in the Yukon, and uh, uh, my father's a prospector, and so he dragged uh, my brother and me out into the bush, and uh, I uh, ended up just sticking on with it, and, uh, and that's actually the genesis of, of Snowline as well. So I'm a co-founder of the company. Uh, it's been a brutal market for a long time now, and nobody would buy these projects, so uh, we had no choice but to launch a junior mining company. My second question was going to be, what is your Yukon connection? But you guys have all done a pretty good job to highlight it with the Kamenak experience. Uh, Scott, having been with the uh, Geological Survey, Tara, more or less born and bred, uh, head of all sorts of uh, uh, associations in terms of plaster mining, that, and then Scott, as he's just indicated, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> um, one, one thing I'd like to know, and, and Put up your hand if you want to answer it first. Who is your ore finder or who are your ore finders on your team? Because in this market, you know, with capital being tough to acquire um, and you needing to be very careful with the drill dollars, who, 
who or who are the individuals they're going to be finding ore for you? Okay, Scott. Right over there, uh, some of them. Um, yeah, we've uh, got that. That's been one of the most exciting parts about launching the company is the team that's come together, and uh, and it's it's not just you know it was companies that we had optioned these projects to before uh, as prospectors did a lot of really good baseline work and uh, and you know some of the uh, well I guess we can't even call it ore yet but you know. Uh, some of the mineralization was already found at that point, and, uh, uh, and then the team coming in has done a fantastic job of, of fleshing things out, and there's a, yeah, a good range of experience. It's just any, any specific names you want to throw out? Oh, there's Thomas and Sergio. Okay, uh, put up your hands. <laughs> so Thomas is our VP Exploration, Sergio is our Chief Geologist, and they've done an incredible job of, uh, of building out uh, what we have there, uh, and, and doing so in a really efficient and, and productive manner through the season and, and safe. Okay, fantastic. Who's next? Tara? Go, okay. So, um, Paul Gray, who was with Victoria Gold, yep. and um, James Tom. And James really gets the credit for developing the model and digging through the, the database to put together the model to really understand what was going on at Airstrip. And then we've got a great team of young geologists as well. And Paul, uh, James is not here today because he just wanted a day to go through the data and not be, be left alone by me. <laughs> well, so it's an interesting point because I think uh, my experience having co-founded a junior is you do need people, I think, 24-7 thinking about how to find ore and not tied up with logistics. And, and uh, James is, yeah, he's a, he's a smart guy. He beat my associate, Jake, in uh, chess uh, when we did our site visit, and that's not easy. Uh, Scott? Sure. We've got uh, Doug Murray, a uh, project geologist sitting over there in our Ray Pan, uh, sitting over in that corner. We've got the whole floor covered. Uh, and as well, our CEO, Simon Ridgway. Simon's a, an older gentleman. You know Simon. Uh, he spent uh, about 10 days out with us uh, prospecting yeah, in the field. He loves to get out there. Impressive. He prefers to be out there than here. Uh, and I was out in the field myself for uh, the whole season as well. Fantastic. Tony. Yes. Um, uh, from our perspective, um, you know, I'm, I'm usually the guy that brings forward the crazy geological ideas and then the actual ore finding is probably attributed to our lead uh, vice president of exploration, Peter Cleesby's. Unfortunately, he's not here with us. But whether it's Trent Newkirk as our senior exploration geologist, Ira Thomas, Kirk Freeman, Mick mm -hmm. Roper, all these people have been involved in discovery of multi-million ounce gold systems. And, and maybe just an insight as to why, with the success in, in the Yukon, you pivoted more to Alaska with, with Tectonic. Yeah, well, after Kamenek was acquired, Yukon got very uh, noisy. Um, mm -hmm. It was a, a lot more staking activity. Um, there was not a whole lot of opportunity left. Uh, I was intrigued with Alaska, given the high-grade gold nature, the unexplored nature. And also, we wanted to work directly with the native corporations. I, saw, okay. I was quite inspired by the... Uh, Peak, which is now called the Mancho deposit. We'll get, and we'll get more into that. Sure. No, that's a good point. Um, we're going to now pivot to the kind of elevator pitches or the presentations, five to eight minutes, uh, up to eight slides or so. I'm, I'm told there's a video uh, or two. <laughs> uh, so we're going to do that. And, and so after they pitch, I'm going to have a few minutes for questions, and then we'll go to the audience. And I've tapped a few people. I really expect uh, them to step up. Uh, make this dynamic. And uh, I think there is a facility on the table to write down questions if you want, and they can come up, or there's a roving mic if you want to be asking questions live. So uh, someone will circulate the tables and pick up questions and then text me. Um, so, Tony, you're up to okay. bat first. Uh, you can stand or sit. And is there, um Yes, that's true. Yeah. Well, that's Mike encouraged me to stand up, but I didn't want to have my back to no, you. I'll just, no, no, I might, go, I might, go ahead. I might stand in, in this position here. So, okay, there, there we go. go. Okay, so what you're looking at is our, obviously a drill photo. Uh, we've launched the first drill program on our flat gold project in 20 years. The main catalyst going forward is going to be drill results. I mean, we have some softer catalysts, such as new project acquisitions, things of that nature. But the culmination of two years of effort in acquiring this asset getting it to the point where we've de-risked it with a full-scale production IBA agreement. It's one of the things that Tectonic does differently is de-risking projects on day one. So we work mostly on native-owned land and we've partnered up with one of Alaska's leading native corporations. I do have a video where the CEO will be speaking to it. But from my perspective, it's go time. We're on the ice, the skates are, are put on, it's time to go score. So this is what we're all here to make that sort of big discovery. Um, you know, I can't promise a discovery, but what I will promise 
is that our team is putting our best foot forward to make this a reality. And we do think we're on the cusp of unveiling the next tier one opportunity in Alaska. Um, this, speaking of Brie X, uh, this slide is here for a reason, so please take the time to read it. It is located uh, on our website before making any investment decision uh, in our company. So big deposits leave big footprints. I think it's important that every CEO or every company, whether you're an investor or a CEO speaking to the board, that you actually understand what your target is. Yes, this is a bulk tonnage, reduced intrusion related gold system, but what is the target? For us, we target tier one opportunities. Well, that's great to say it, but show me the evidence. So the evidence that you see here, this is a small snippet of a 40 kilometer by 40 kilometer um, large 92,000 acre land position, again, on native land in Alaska. We're in the same mineral belt that has already produced one tier one deposit. That's the Donlin Gold deposit, which is co-owned by Barrick and Nova Gold, currently sitting at north of 40 million ounces. So that's a, a good sign that you're in the right jurisdiction. Secondly, this is the fourth richest placer mining jurisdiction in all of Alaska. We have several potential intrusions here. Chicken Mountain is credited as the bedrock source for 1.4 million ounces of placer gold. The intrusion, we, you can see it here, it's the big red circle. It's six kilometers by six kilometers in size. And those pink lines that you see, that's the recorded plaster production spilling out of this intrusion. Not only on the left side, but also on the right side where there's no drilling. Good evidence to support that that side is also mineralized. And then we have the golden apex. You talked about the Craig Hart re uh, reduced intrusion related gold model. There's a volcanic cap rock there. Uh, underneath that is Hornfells. Uh, we have two historical drill holes that carry up to 20 grams per ton gold, telling us that that could be a, a potential buried intrusion. And then the next anomaly is actually a old hard rock mine formerly owned by Placer Dome that produced about 2,500 ounces. So we can trust the geophysical anomalies that did, they could potentially represent buried intrusions. We have 55 historical drill holes. We talked about Fort Knox. That was discovered and advanced by Fairbanks Gold, funded by Robert Friedland. They had, fair, they had uh, Fort Knox and they also had Flat. The first drill hole in this property was put there by the people that advanced Fort Knox into production. They were looking for a lookalike back in the mid 80s. Fort Knox is on a highway. This is very remote. 0.8 grams per ton doesn't always get people excited. Off they went. Um, out of those 55 historical drill holes, 25 ended in mineralization. And the average vertical drill depth is only 100 meters. So that, in conjunction with the golden soils, a four kilometer golden soil anomaly, is telling us that we're onto something potentially massive. We also, um, I mentioned about de-risking, aside from the production IBA agreement, we, we did metallurgy before we drilled this property. We wanted to know, are we dealing with refractory ore, or we're we dealing with something that's free milling. And so far, the first phase of metallurgical tests have demonstrated an open pit heat leach opportunity is uh, potentially viable at flat. Okay, so this is the video. This is, uh, this is actually the movie premiere. I'll just kick it off here. Um, it highlights myself and the CEO of Doyon um, on site. So I'll just sit quiet here while this plays. Big deposits leave big footprints. So that's our belief. We look for geological evidence that supports a large mineralizing system. We don't care about 500,000 ounces. We want to find a tier one deposit. We had success in the Yukon, a successful mining project, but also good success with the community and the First Nations there. You know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Doyon. So we want to acknowledge that we're on Doyon land and we're working collaboratively together to ultimately find a mine that benefits shareholders and stakeholders. So Doyon is an Alaska Native corporation created by Congress in the, when they passed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act 1971. We are the regional corporation for interior Alaska, so we're a very large region with a fairly small population. Congress told us to select a lot of our own land back, so we have a little over 12 million acres. Congress also told us to be a for-profit business and go out and make money for our shareholders who are Alaska Native people. We had 9,081 shareholders in 1972. We have about 20,500 shareholders today. I 
think regardless of what industry you're in, it's all about the people. We said, hey, we want to go meet with the local communities and villages before we acquire this project. And that really resonated with them. They saw us in the communities doing educational workshops. We also form production agreements. These agreements cover exploration, production, reclamation, but also environmental considerations and also scholarship contributions, things that would benefit the communities. We have a, a mandated workforce obligation where we hire locally, things of that nature. In rural Alaska, it can sustain a regional economy with jobs, with tax revenue, infrastructure, all the things that come from those projects. So you can see that excitement in a community and job-based and training all those things that, that people need. It's been a, a nice relationship for us at Doyon and we proved that by investing in the company as well. You know, nothing speaks more loudly than someone saying, here's my hard earned money, go explore my property. So now we're, we're standing on the top of Chicken Mountain on, on the east side. The scale of this thing is, is enormous. It's, it's a very, very, very large, large mineralized system. The benefit of Chicken Mountain is that it has 55 historical drill holes. We're in an unglaciated terrain, so not only do we have the drill holes, we have four kilometer by almost one kilometer golden soil anomaly that's telling us there's a big system. We have a geophysical anomaly that's three times that size, and then we have this big placer endowment. So it, it has something very unique that other projects don't necessarily have. There's a 20 year gap of exploration in here, which is, to me, it's an unprecedented opportunity to explore using these modern techniques. So this project has a lot of boxes ticked that tells us we're on a big mineralizing system. The opportunity to put together a significant gold resource is very promising and you know, be able to work on, on something of this caliber. You, you know, it's kind of a geologist's dream. What's a really important aspect of the future is to get some resource projects or other cash economy into our rural communities. So it's an alignment of values as much as anything. To say I am proud of the relationship with Doyne would be an understatement. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And trusting us to work on their land is a huge endorsement and so we value that significantly. bypass uh, a lot of this and just highlight a bit of the team which we touched upon. Uh, it was, it's relevant to note that most of the discoveries, at least the gold discoveries, that our team has been involved with is in the Tatina Gold Belt. And uh, I think it's important when you look at a team and the people, it's not just geology. Yes, this is a technical session, but finding gold is important, finding economic gold more important, and obviously the ability to permit that. But you can see sort of the boxes that our team ticks here. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up here with just our share price performance and uh, you know we've done quite well if you're in our last financing um, you're in the green which is quite shocking given the current market conditions and I will uh, end off by saying we actually have indigenous shareholders that have invested up to four million dollars in our company um, and that would be the native corporation so with that being said I'll leave it at that thank you okay very good thanks Tony <laughs>and your average grades, uh, roughly, or on a length-weighted average uh, grade basis? Um, well, I, I would, you know, if Have I adhere to NI 43101, we don't have a compliant resource, but we do, what I love about the system is that there's, there's bulk tonnage, so we have like 0.98 grams per ton over 100 meters in historical drilling, but we also have 12 grams over 24, and drill core that carries 200 grams over a meter. 
So I would, I would say this is going to be a traditional, at least based on what we know, it's going to be in the, the uh, gram range is what we're, we're seeing. So, you, so on the bulk disseminated, you're, you're about 100 gram meter product. And then on the higher grade, local high grade zones, what was the intercept again? Uh, the highest one is 200 grams over a meter, yeah. but okay. 12 grams over 24. OK, no, fair enough. And uh, I, I did warn each one a few questions that were going to be coming. Uh, and one is the bismuth gold ratio, if you're willing to share. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, again, uh, we, this is our first drill program. This is really the only <laughs> <laughs> This is our first drill program. So most of our data has been derived. They did do like bismuth uh, analysis in some of the historical holes. Tellurium was not done. But we're, we're seeing, you know, sometimes 250 times up um, uh, above so detection limit. Do you have an average, or is that the peak? Um, that, that would be the peak. Okay. Um, but your bismuth to gold is, you know, uh, 3.5 to 1. There's a range. Okay. Sometimes it's 15 to 1. It also depends on the different host rock. Yep. Um, that it, uh, it, it varies. But there's definitely a strong correlation between bismuth, tellurium, and gold. Um, and then we're seeing, that's where we're seeing the highest grade uh, okay. intervals. And before we go to the audience, um, do you want to talk about the price action in your stock? It's, you know, you've had quite a bit of uh, movement uh, sure. throughout the year. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and how, how uh, impactful is seasonality on your share price? Uh, well, it's, it's funny. Uh, seasonality is something that typically plagues us. Last year, our stock ran in the winter months and had the best <laughs> performance. And we're kind of in the same predicament right now where the stock is, is performing quite well, especially given the backdrop that we're in. So um, I think there's a, a lot of excitement, us included. Our largest shareholder and financial supporter is Crestcat. Yep. They're big, you know, they were in on Snowline and other uh, Tintina stories early on, us included. So um, we've been able to capture some of that uh, momentum and enthusiasm. And I think, I don't, you know, knock on wood here, but I, I do think it's going to continue. Uh, just given that the year is the anticipation of drill results uh, probably uh, the end of the year, yeah. you know, early Q1. Okay, um, a reminder, there is a texting number on the table. You can text, that'll go back to uh, the back table to Stephanie Hansen of Snowline and I'll, I'll get it. Let's go to the audience uh, for some questions. Uh, I think Ben Whiting had a question. Well, you got lots of technical people here, so I might as well shift to the other side. You mentioned sure. Yeah. And I guess it came to light in 1997. Yes. Um, was when the uh, proverbial hit the fan. Um, a lot of projects for the next five years after that died on the vine. Yes. You see Alaska and particularly the whole trend as being a place where you could uh, find the projects that fell through the cracks. Are there going to be many more projects that you see? that uh, disappeared from people's attention and are just sitting there, but have this historic potential? Well, that's pretty short answers. Yeah. Uh, well, yes is the, uh, the answer to your question. Um, and our flat project is a great example because Fairbanks Gold dropped it in 2000. So 1999 is when the VSC collapsed, uh, for those that recall that. So um, Alaska is ripe for the plucking uh, for those people that can, that can stomach the north. Um, it's, uh, there's no shortage of opportunity and, you know, Alaska's the size of BC and Yukon combined and the mineral tenure is phenomenal and the infrastructure is actually quite, quite phenomenal as well for a northern jurisdiction. So, yeah, no shortage of opportunities in front of us. It's just about having a market that will support ec early stage exploration. A little bit more time, but just over a minute. I think Mick Carew had his hand up at one point. Uh, yeah, so um, you said you had uh, 55 historic drill holes. Yes. Um, so the current drill grade on the program that you're going to embark on, uh, well, first of all, what's the vintage of those holes? Sorry. It's uh, no Vintage of those holes, and secondly, in terms of the program, will any of those be kind of, you know, uh, re-drilling some of those holes for verification, or will they all be expansion drilling, or what's the plan? Sure, the, there was two, two attempts. Um, so one was by Fairbanks Gold, 1985 to 89. And then, sorry, the second one was uh, 1995 to 2000. So those are the, the okay. two vintages of drill core. Right. Um, most of the drill core, the diamond drill core, was stored in a warehouse, in the, the Native Corporation warehouse, which is where we used to the, um, where we collected the samples for metallurgical analysis. Um, the first hole of the program, um, there is one of the, the core area that's most mineralized 
Um, they never did oriented diamond drilling back in the day there. So um, that's one thing that we've introduced. And it not only um, was a step out about 100 meters from the 12 grams over 24, but we also drove it down to 500 meters. And so we, we wanted to see if, you know, based on the bismuth thalarium, <laughs> And you know, if you believe in the model, just it's you have 20 historical holes in this one section over 400 meters, and every hole hit gold. And you have the 12 grams over 24. So use oriented diamond drilling to get um, structural orientation. See, can you connect things? How does it hang? And then drive further down into the pluton or further down in the cupola, if you will. And then the next hole after that was a 400 meter step out. And then we went and did some more reconnaissance with the RC. So it's uh, designed to understand historically what's there, see what's at depth, and then test some new exploration targets. We're going to cut it off there. Maybe save a question. We're going to be back later at the very end for more Q&A. But uh, that's, that's the time allocation. Scott Castleman, VPX Rackla, you're up to about. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I think there we are. This is a, a shot of uh, our drill on, on our hit property. Uh, beautiful uh, day. Uh, we had a, actually a really nice summer up there. Even though there were lots of fires in the north, we managed to escape it where we were. Um, Rakla, as you'll see from my presentation, is a uh, relatively new kid on the block compared to the, the other three companies uh, uh, presenting up here today. Uh, so we'll look at some earlier stage projects. Uh, and, and why Rakla got involved in the Tadita Gold Belt. Um, Rakla started acquiring ground uh, in, uh, the, in the eastern part of the belt, uh, right at the Yukon Northwest Territories border. We started by staking three claims uh, south of where the uh, North Canal Road crosses into the NWT, the Rack Main, the Joss, and uh, the Cinnabar, which Cinnabar we decided doesn't meet our criteria, We've, we're gonna be letting that one go. And then uh, that was done uh, late last summer, uh, and then shortly thereafter in September of last year, we signed options on our three key projects, which are the HIT, Astro, and SIR. Uh, you can see on the nor uh, sorry right top side of the slide here. Uh, and then through the winter, we did more research and we staked another three properties, the Excite, the Black, and the Flat. So three of the properties are options, the other five are 100% owned, uh, staked by Rackland Metals. Our reason for going to the belt, uh, as I say, we went late last year, was because of the success of the guy, other people up on stage here. Tara and her company were very rapidly able to build a 6.2 million ounce uh, resource in a very short period of time. That was very interesting. Scott and his crew uh, were able to develop something that's uh, a reduced intrusion uh, related gold system with spectacular results. And uh, our CEO, Simon Ridgway, could not uh, stand by and watch this happen. So he figured we had to get involved. Uh, so we did a lot of research uh, to get in there and, and these are the properties uh, that we decided uh, merited further work. The criteria, criteria we used for selecting was pretty well the list that Michael had shown on the board. Uh, they were projects that had good gold and stream sediment anomalies. If there was that tellurium uh, bismuth association, even better. We were looking for Cretaceous intrusions, uh, the uh, tombstone tungsten and, and Mayo sweet uh, intrusions in that belt are the key ones. Uh, we were looking for a magnetic signature that from these reduced intrusion systems, generally is about a kilometer in diameter, generally is a magnetic low surrounded by the Hornfels magnetic high, um, and uh, projects that had some historic work done on them that maybe wasn't quite followed through with this model in mind. So that's how we came uh, to acquire these uh, nine projects. So I'll zoom into the Astro, that uh, was our, our flagship, is our flagship project. Uh, the Astro Intrusion, as you can see on the circle on the left, uh, it straddles the Yukon Northwest Territories border. It's just to the north of the North <coughs> Canal Road. You can see the uh, airplane down at the bottom right of the circle. That's where our camp is located. It's, our camp varies from about five kilometers to 12 kilometers from our drill sites. Uh, the Astro uh, work uh, zoomed in in the map on the top right. Uh, there was a bunch of historic work done in 2017 to 2019 in the sedimentary rocks uh, northeast of the intrusion. The focus there it was uh, Newmont and Everham did that work and they were focusing on Carlin style mineralization. They didn't find Carlin style, but they did come up with a lot of soil, stream sediment, rock sample, gold anomalies. We looked at that database looking for the bismuth tellurium association and there was a great correlation. 
none of their work was done, or virtually none was done inside the intrusion. So we took that work and, and brought it, uh, this, the same suite of surveys into the intrusion, uh, stream sediment sampling, soil sampling, prospecting, and we drilled uh, 12 holes for a total of 2,000 meters on the astro uh, intrusion, astro property. To the north is the HIT property. Uh, Astro is an option from origin royalties. HIT is an option from Avon uh, resources. And we just exercised all three of the, the options uh, that you see on the circle to the left just last week. So we really like the properties. We're getting good results. Uh, going to HIT, uh, there was a bunch of historic work done there. The last work was done, I believe, in about 2006. That work mostly focused on the Hornfels margins. The Hornfels margins of these are gossinous, shiny. Uh, as a geologist, I can understand why people go and look at these things and, and rarely go into the intrusive rocks, which tend to look boring uh, for the most part. There's relatively little alteration, and you're just looking for sheet veins. Uh, we took the work that was done at HIT, uh, modeled it, and went inside the intrusion, focusing virtually all of our work in there, stream sediment sampling again, soil sampling, uh, prospecting, and we drilled five holes on HIT, scattered all around the intrusion, uh, testing a variety of targets. You can see at the bottom right of the map, uh, in, in color-coded is an arsenic uh, in soil anomaly and a bismuth arsenic in soil anomaly, and in that area we mapped uh, an abundance of sheeted veins off, on surface. The rock on surface there, it's above tree line. It all spalls off into very narrow slabby uh, pieces of, of uh, granite diorite. And the picture on the left, on the bottom, is a picture from our hole uh, number three at HIT. And you can see the uh, density of sheeted veins there. Those veins have pyrotite, a little bit of pyrite, arsenopyrite, bismuthinite. Uh, and I didn't mention at Astro, but one of the holes there uh, intersected a, a very white soft mineral, which we believe is pure bismuth. Uh, it's in uh, for petrographic work right now, so we'll, we'll determine that very shortly. So we do have bismuth in the system in, at both the HIT and uh, Astro. And this is a section from two of our holes at hit, uh, hit number three, hit number four, and you can see the color bars there are the density of, of sheeted veins uh, that we're getting down hole. Uh, our highest density over one meter was 55 very narrow veins uh, over a meter. So it, it's, uh, it's really intense. And based on the results that these, that, well, particularly what Scott's getting at um, Valley, uh, we're really encouraged by that density of veining. And then another picture of core uh, on the left, and you can see that pattern, uh, that striped pattern there. That's not foliation, that's veining in the uh, granite diorite. And then looking at SIR, we didn't drill SIR this year, but we hit it again with the, the early suite of uh, stream sand soil and, and uh, prospecting. Uh, I should also mention that we flew airborne surveys over all three of those projects. Astro had an older survey, we tagged onto that. Um, again, seeing lots of sheeted veining at SIR. Uh, if you can see the numbers of the gold in rock samples there, we had numerous samples greater than uh, three grams per ton. All of them are, or the majority of them are on the margins of the intrusion in the Hornfels rocks uh, at the bottom right. Um, and there's a photo at the bottom showing the density of, of sheeted veins in the intrusion. So that's the targets we didn't get around to drilling this year. Uh, in total, we drilled 17 holes, 3,000 meters, but it's on our bucket list uh, for early next year. That's our team. Uh, I mentioned Doug and Armand in, are in the audience. Simon has a long history in the Yukon, started as a prospector, claim staker, line cutter, eventually worked to form, uh, start forming his own company. He's been financing for a long time, and he's found mines and put mines into production. But he loves the exploration side. Uh, there's our uh, uh, share, uh, outstanding shares. We're 71 million now, fully diluted 91. Insiders hold 30%. We have 2.7 million in cash as of yesterday. Uh, so we're well financed. We did the financing late summer so that we can start uh, early next year. Uh, we're still awaiting uh, the last few batches of drill sample results. I expect those within the next couple of weeks and then we'll press release everything that we have at that point. Um, Drilling is planned to start uh, 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 on Astro and HIT uh, early in 2024, 
middle May is about the time you can start working up there. We plan a maiden drill program on Sur next year and uh, we'll take our other properties and try to build them up to the drill stage as well. And then ongoing uh, research and looking at other opportunities. So further to Ben's question, we think there's lots of potential there still. Thank you. Great, thanks. Well, I can, I can attest to the great exposure having been up to site this summer uh, to the project. Uh, how much value is that Newmont data set in terms of dollars? Like, how much are you leveraging Ooh, in terms I of past think they spent, so they, they, it was, uh, the work was done in the 2017 to 19 period, and I think they spent two and a half million on it. So okay. that's recent, okay. recent start. dollars. It's a great data set, as yeah. you know, they do good work. And it's pretty early it's days. It's all in the sediments, although unfortunately, yeah, that's what but I was that say. did leave it open for us. Early days in terms yeah. of the intrusives uh, with only 2,000 meters drilled to date, so it's yeah. early innings. Um, one thing, a couple things, I guess, uh, you emphasized the Cretaceous age mattering in the tombstone belt. Maybe expand on that a bit for everyone. Yeah, so uh, w within the uh, tombstone belt, uh, the, all of the intrusions, except for Tara hasn't been able to find one yet, are, are a Cretaceous age. Uh, there's a very narrow band uh, between the, the different suites, the tungsten suite, the tombstone suite, and the Mayo suite, but all three of those host uh, gold deposits. Uh, so any one of those is, is prospective. Um, and there, there are other ones, but they continue all the way along. Uh, I, it didn't mention, but uh, uh, historically, the eastern part of the belt, there are tungsten deposits there at Mactung and, and the past producing Canton mine. Historically, the eastern part of the belt was believed to be tungsten rich and gold poor, whereas the western part of the belt did have tungsten, but it, it was believed to be gold rich. And what we're finding, from, particularly from Scott's work and his team, uh, is that that's not necessarily the case. And, and what we see at HIP, Astro, and the other okay. locations, there's lots of gold in, in the eastern part. Let's, let's just talk about gold in terms of, there's visible gold in some of the systems, and I'm gonna steal Craig Hart's uh, comment for a lot of the disseminated gold, it is uh, fly shit size. So you can't see it, it's, it, uh, it's non-refractory, obviously, and it's very, very important uh, as a majority component to a lot of these deposits. So visible gold is, is very uh, wide ranging in its, in its currents. Um, and uh, for example, Victoria Gold Eagle Mine, I was told by, I think it was Paul Gray, there's uh, out of 250 kilometers of drilling, there's only 12 incidents of VG. And I think, uh, you know, Tara and, and Scott can find that in some, in some cases in 12 meters, 12 <laughs> incidents. So there's quite a range. Maybe, maybe you can just touch on that a little bit, Scott. Yeah, um, to yeah we, we did not see much visible gold uh, in our core. We did see uh, some in, or one hand sample, uh, yep. field sample that we collected. And uh, we did some panning on one of our occurrences. I can't remember which one, if it was hit or sir. Uh, and there was flower gold uh, in that uh, heavy mineral concentrate. So it, it, if it's there, it's very fine. Uh, and yeah, we still got some work to do. <coughs> and, and phases, you have a megachristic phase. Do you think that's important or is it just part of the it's, evolution of the system? It seems to be in general. When you look at okay. the deposits in the belt, we haven't determined any phases yet from, from our okay. drilling, but uh, we're keeping our eyes open for that. Let's, let's go to the audience for questions. Um, <coughs> I think Jerry Carlson had one. Um, Jerry? Yeah, <laughs> if we could have the mic come over to Jerry. Uh, I, I guess I'm one of the, uh, you know, one of the old timers. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was always the tungsten out there, and and tungsten's important in the West for sure. It's an association, yeah. but but I, I'm interested to see how you're able to come back to the eastern part of the Yukon. And uh, but my question though is actually more to do with geophysics. I I noticed when Michael was starting out, he mentioned geophysics was important, especially airborne and z -TEM. and I'm wondering what kind of airborne geophysics you're using and how has z -TEM been flown over the property? We didn't do z -TEM this year. We used the Precision uh, Triple Boon Gradient Mag. Uh, they also had a VLFEM sensor and a radiometric sensor on there. So we've got those three data sets that we'll be uh, working with uh, over the winter. Okay. Uh, we've still got a few minutes. Harry Polk Grant, did you have something on the financial side? you wanted to bring up? <laughs> You're gonna have a mic to Harry in the middle, uh, Jasmine. Hey, sorry, don't, don't have a voice. Okay, anybody else? Okay, here we go, in the front here. Gore Chapman, uh, B2 Gold. 
I see that the plutons here, or the intrusions, are sort of straddling the border between Yukon and Northwest Territories. Have you found any issues with permitting there or differences between the two? Uh, there are differences. Uh, no issues yet. Uh, so so our, all of it, everything that we staked we need, in the Yukon side, we had to apply for permits this year. And they, all the work that we were doing was in what's considered a class one, and that was all seamless. Uh, no problem at all. The uh, Astro on the Northwest Territory side, we are riding the tail end of uh, Evram's five-year expiration permit. That expires in March of this coming year. And early in the summer, we applied for an extension to that permit and been working with the Sawtoo Land and Water Board on that. And they've had that uh, application in all month long, uh, sorry, all summer long. And so far, there are no issues with that one. So hopefully, we can, we can just roll that over and keep going. Any more questions? I should also mention very quickly that because we're straddling the border and we're in the boundaries between and our property stretch over such a long area, we're dealing with four different First Nations, uh, two on the Yukon, two on the Northwest Territory side. Uh, and we've uh, reached out to all of them and, and have had no issues in dealing with them. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Scott. Uh, next up to bat is uh, Terry Christie, CEO of Banyan. Take it away. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, everyone knows where we are right now. So um, I'm the president and CEO of Banyan. You're looking at our project site. Um, you'll notice a few things in this photograph. One, you can see the, the main road. This is the highway that goes through the property. All, also the brand new power line that was just reconstructed in 2021. It's only energized to half of the capacity that it's built to, and it services two mines in the community of Kino up the road. So. How often do you actually have a power line that has capacity already on your property? It's only 50 kilometers south to the hydroelectric dam down that road. This is the road out to Victoria Gold. You're looking at our 6.2 million ounces right here, an on-surface low strip ratio deposit. Um, cell phone service, even four bars on the cell phone here. Fiber optic cable goes out along that road out to Victoria Gold. We need 50 meters of power line to connect to our own grid, which would connect our camps. That's just to get us across the highway right away. Um, so that's a pretty small distance of power line that's needed. Also, really moderate topography here. No rivers, no lakes, no key wildlife areas, uh, no steep mountains, no glaciers. Those are all great for mine building. Um, I'll be making forward-looking statements as well. And, you know, I have a little video. We've changed it up a little bit from the, from the last time. Um, but there, you know, all of our, our properties, uh, including Sitka, also off to the west. Uh, Victoria Gold, you know, will be a 200,000 ounce producer. He bleached, that's the plan. Their Raven deposit, they've put out some pretty spectacular results from that. We stand at our Thompson Creek camp and we can see the lights of those drills across the valley. So that's very close to us. 1.1 million ounces at 1.7 there, and I think that's going to be a much higher grade deposit. Here you can see our on surface. Uh, it's on surface, three deposits. Uh, airstrip, which is what, where the first mineralization was. Uh, we'll get to it in just a second. Uh, the power line deposit, which was our discovery in 2019. You know, if Victoria Gold hadn't uh, changed the location of their substation to across the road, we might not have drilled there. You know, James put together that geological model, but Victoria Gold thankfully had cleared it and uh, it wasn't geotechnically suitable because there was too much overburden. So we didn't even need like, to, any bonding. We didn't need to upgrade our permit to drill on that. We could just go and drill it, and that's really when we made the discovery there at Powerline. And it's gone from nothing to over 3.8 million ounces in just since, since discovery in 2019. There you can see the resource. The gray is the pit shell. Um, Oryx Hill and Powerline are now connected with the drilling that we're doing. If we did a resource update, that would now be a more continuous uh, body there. But generally, you know, five kilometers by a kilometer and a half of mineralization on surface. The deposit is open. It's open at depth. It's open to the west. It's open to the east um, and also to the south. Uh, airstrip, we believe, would dip underneath power line. Cal airstrip is a calcareous deposit, dips at about 60 degrees. If we drill deep beneath power line, we believe we'd intersect it. And power line are these sh same sheeted veins with lots of visible gold that you see at snow line, with the exception that we're in the meta sediments and we haven't found an intrusion yet. Um, so we'll have lots of catalysts from the drilling that we did, uh, both expanding the resource to the east at Oryx Hill. Um, but again, you know, lots of uh, the key tier one attributes that all of these projects are talking about. Our goal this year was, or last year, was to get over five million ounces to be significant. Uh, and we have the advantage of being year round where we are with those roads. We routinely drill into December, start again in February. That's a huge advantage. You know, people think of northern projects and they think they're 
They're not accessible in the winter. We see that Victoria Gold and Hecla, right beside us, uh, also uh, operate all year round. Our share structure, uh, I'm the third CEO of this company. I took it over in 2016 as the CEO, had to find another property. I knew about Ormac actually because I've got a long history of alluvial mining. I actually privately purchased the alluvial rights over top of this property in 2013. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I knew about it, and that and knowing good old Bernie Kraft, another Yukon prospector who'd taken out some high grade rate from surface, uh, so set out to acquire it. But that means I didn't get any seed stock and I've had to buy my position in the market. I'm currently a 4% shareholder, which means I've made over a million and a half dollars in investment in the last couple of years. So I'm pretty heavily vested alongside my shareholders to make money through my share price. Uh, we have Victoria Gold as an 11.3% shareholder. We have a Cisco development, Franklin Gold and Fidelity as large shareholders and another institutional uh, ownership at 30%. Uh, it's an interesting jurisdiction with both Hecla right beside us and Victoria Gold. It was nice to see uh, Hecla purchase attack. Nice to know you're interested in gold uh, in, uh, in the Yukon. Our team, you know, I think we have all the skill sets. We are lean and mean and we spend dollars well. Our all-in drill cost this year was $400 a meter, even with the regional exploration that we did. And we did considerable regional exploration. We have 300 square kilometers. We focused on less than 5% of it uh, during our exploration because we were so focused on adding ounces. Uh, and this year we, stuck, we stepped out to do basic soil sampling and drilling on our, our Nitra as well as South Ormac. But because this project is getting to that scale where we need to start thinking about project development, we've added new members to our team, Kai Wollishen, uh, lives in Whitehorse. He was just a, a key member leading the Encero consulting firm in Whitehorse doing most of the baseline studies and permitting for many of the other Yukon projects, some of who are in the room. Um, he's a great addition to our team. He knows permitting and yes, uh, that combined with, with my experience in permitting and understanding of environmental assessment I think is really key for us. Uh, we continue to have a strong technical team adding Brad Thrall to help us both with understanding the economics and the metallurgy. Mark Blythe who's here as well brings that wealth of mining experience and economics and, and, and how you move these projects forward along with Jason Neal. Um, you know, we've got a, a great team that has all the skill sets to move us forward. I think we, we check, check all the boxes as well, and you'll hear that from all the companies. Uh, there are not very many um, tier one assets. You know, we're the fifth largest resource in North America with our 6.2 million ounces. A tier one location where you can permit with one First Nation and a settled First Nation that has agreements with the two mines beside us. We've got that existing infrastructure, which is a huge advantage. We have existing baseline data. We've got two mines beside us showing you can do it. Uh, our current valuation at about $10 per ounce is pretty compelling. We'll have lots of news flow this year through um, uh, the exploration results we have. Importantly, we have a strong treasury with just under $9 million in the bank today. That uh, gets us all of our GNA plus a very significant exploration program for next year. We're starting to really de-risk this on all the technical fronts, doing some high-level engineering to understand um, how you might mine it, looking at where the high grades are, doing that metallurgical work. I think it's an exciting jurisdiction. Thanks to the other explorers, we're getting lots of attention in the Yukon. And uh, our metallurgy, you know, we've got a very robust program. We've said that we'll have uh, information coming here in fourth quarter. We think we're well on track for that. Uh, early work, similar to Snowline, these deposits, you know, when you, you do bottle rolls on pulps, you come back with 90%. Um, so amenable to cyanide. We're looking at both range from heap leach to mill and CIL. We know it's not refractory, uh, but look forward to more work or for information on this as we go into the fall. And there will be more results into the new year as well. We're encouraged that we're already starting next phases. Permitting, we have a huge advantage here in that we have all of Hecla's data. Alexco, that's part of our agreement, had committed to give us all their baseline data along with Victoria Gold. We did a gap analysis <coughs> back in 2021 and started our own programs to supplement that, which means we have a huge advantage in how fast we could potentially permit this project, with the key caveats, of course, being you need to have that relationship with the First Nation, and you need to decide what your project is before you go into permitting. But um, lots of key attributes with the infrastructure and no key wildlife areas on our property. Um, that's just showing, you know, there we are at uh, the fifth largest uh, resource in North America. We believe the project has the potential to, to continue to add answers to get us further up that curve uh, and closer to the top, but there's not very many out there. And uh, I like this little quote from Warren Buffett, whether we're talking about stocks or socks, I like to buy in quality merchandise when it's marked down. And I think that applies to all of the quality explorers that you're hearing from. Very good.
Well, I'm going to combine an audience question with a question I had. Uh, very rapid growth. Congratulations. Thank you. 6.2. When's the next resource? Well, you know, it, I think people can already do the math. Powerline and Oryx Hill are so remarkably consistent. I don't think we need to rush to do that. I think okay. we need to hit the next milestone when we can see like 8 million ounces or we're ready to launch into a PA. Those are probably catalysts. In this market, resource <coughs> updates aren't getting value. You don't um, necessarily want to be in the 8 million ounce club. I think there's only been, there's yeah, less than 12 uh, 8 million ounce Greenfield discoveries since t uh, 2006. So it is, it is a bit of a special club if yeah. you go there. Yeah, well, I need a few more meters to get there. Okay. Um, but, and is that the best value? And that's kind of the question we're asking ourselves is how do we add the most value in 2024 for our shareholders? What's the market can actually appreciate? Yeah, we could get there. Um, uh, cost per meter again, I think you mentioned it. So um, we 400 per meter okay. all in this year, and that includes considerable. If it's only drilling, it's probably more like 375. Okay, you're the only one with the infrastructure. Canadian. Infrastructure Canadian. In yeah, Canadian. Uh, advantage, maybe expand on that a little bit in terms of not having a seasonality. Uh. Yeah, so COVID is actually good for us. It meant we had to buy all kinds of things and we had, got, had to get used to having shortages of things. So we did things like bought in large fuel tanks so we can take three B trains full of fuel. So we can store 120,000 liters of fuel. Mm -hmm. So that's given us price optionality. We don't have to worry about barrels. Um, we watch fuel prices and you know we can have 30 days of uh, of 30 to 45 days of fuel stored on site, which means we can actually get better prices than just about anybody else. Plus, we've got Victoria Gold there right beside us, so there's already a really established route. It's highway accessible, 150 meters off the highway. You don't have a lot of transport costs for your fuel. Um, we put in a tremendous amount of, of our own infrastructure, you know, shops, and we purchased all of our, our pickup trucks and everything else, yeah. so we don't have any rental costs on any of that. And that's really paid off now because we, we, we don't have a, a high exploration cost. We used to be $250 a meter. We were $2 an ounce in our first resource. Um, so that's why people say, well, why haven't you done regional exploration? There was no extra money. We were so yeah. focused on adding ounces. What's your bismuth to gold ratio? Okay, it's different for the different deposits. Okay. So Airstrip has 16 to one. Okay. Um, when you go to Air, Air Powerline and Oryx Hill are about eight to one. Okay. And, and then tellurium? tellurium is about 0.8 for uh, airstrip, 0.7 for power line, and 0.3 for Oryx Hill. Okay, thanks. And we'll come back to Scott later yeah. to get those. And give James a little bit longer, and he'll show you the distribution of where all that is. But he, he's been really busy lately. Okay. <laughs> I just got a text from uh, Quentin Henai. Tara, when are you going to drill that deep hole and find the mothership intrusion? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, we we have contemplating. We've got a few you know dots on a map, and we also have the little challenges of forest fires this year, which um, was probably the the main reason why we didn't keep drilling into the fall, yeah. um, and then the markets really sold off. So that was one of the things we were definitely thinking about for um, you know fall drilling. So mm -hmm. stay tuned on that. We still have cash for it if if we think that's the best use of our our money. Okay, and and you have flat veins, sheeted vein complex yep. within sediments. And you didn't so show the long section, I don't think. But, no, not in this but presentation. Maybe just briefly touch on the fact you do have some higher grade zones within yep. uh, the deposits. Maybe just uh, touch on that in terms of the optionality you may have on, on processing. So yeah, so one way to look at it, um, so just go back to our sensitivity chart. So I didn't put that in there either. You know, if we depict a 0.5 cutoff, we would have 4.5 million ounces at 0.95. And that's yeah. in our 43-101, so people can do their own math. You, higher cutoff grade. Um, is not in. And that also goes to some of our highest grade intercepts, which I know you're going to ask me, you know, like 75 meters of 1.75. And there's a okay. couple holes that are very similar to that. So yes, we do have some high grade zones. Some of it start right on surface. We generally see a couple trends through the deposits that are east, um, east west. We've got kind of a northern zone that's right on surface and then a southern zone that is a little bit deeper, uh, but again, shows where those high grade trends are. And that's something that we're working pretty hard to try and understand what the controls and distribution of that is. So that's, a, that's 150 to 200 gram meter intercept. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the audience. We've got a few minutes. Uh, Mike Berkey, did you want to chime in here in terms of your background with seeing a lot of these systems and specifically on, on uh, <laughs> sure. Bandits Ormac? I mean, Thanks. I was l lucky enough to uh, visit Bernie when he was high grading on the uh, airstrip area back in the day. Uh, there was a felsic dike associated with the yeah. mineralization there that he mined. 
I'm sure you know you're you're searching for that intrusion that we know is down there. Um, but are you seeing lots of felsic dikes in your drilling? Do you see higher grade gold associated with those dikes when you do intersect them in the drilling that you're doing on any of the deposits that you're working on there? So the felsic dikes are mostly airstrip, and we do we do see them there, and they're not actually associated directly with the higher grade gold. So they haven't been a hmm, here's the smoking gun. Um, yes, there was an intrusion that created that somewhere, but I don't know where. I'm not sure. You know, we almost have, um, we think, multiple phases of mineralization, so it makes it a little bit more complex. We do have, um, you know, we're working on understanding the distribution of, of like, andalusite and cordierite, uh, trying to get some isograds. We've got good old Peter Reed, who's 88 and works for Hecla, too. Is, he's busy really trying to help us with some of that. We're doing some age dating, too, with some of the shelite, trying to understand the age of mineralization, because we do know that, that um, uh, you know, we've been asked lots of questions and given lots of opinions on what people think is going on. So we're working on it, Mike. <laughs> yeah, my my understanding is there is a felsic dike that goes from the property all the way to Kino Hill. So that's a fairly major. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're kicking around there. Yeah. And certainly to see the intensity of mineralization in the meta sediments, uh, the, the uh, intrusive source or whatever's down there is probably multi phase going over a few millions of years, not, not too much, but. Uh, it's going to be pretty pretty exciting when you tap into that, I hope. So again, that comes back to Craig Hart's model of the attenuated intrusion up in the sediments, sheeted veins, and to depth there being that potential prize. Uh, let's, we've used our allotted time, so let's now move to Scott Burdell, CEO of Snowline. You're up to bat. Thanks, Michael. All right, so uh, yeah, we're Snowline Gold. Uh, we are, uh, our flagship project is the Rogue Project out in the eastern end of the Tombstone Gold Belt and the Tintina Gold Belt. Uh, we're located in the, uh, Rogue is located in the traditional territory of the Nachonaik Dun First Nation. And uh, we are not uh, too far from the, the North Canal Road, um, about uh, 75 kilometers. <coughs> Uh, and as with the others, we'll be making forward-looking statements. Uh, that's an important part of what we do. Um, for the, on the corporate side, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we have about 145 million shares outstanding, 160 fully diluted. Uh, we have a very strong treasury. Uh, we have around 40 million in the bank right now with another 18 million in warrants that are in the money and set to expire uh, within the next year. Um, so uh, a strong treasury to, uh, to keep us going forward. And uh, the stock has, uh, you know, has seen some uh, positive response to, uh, to news, but it's certainly not one-to-one. -one. Uh, we, we come out with uh, great holes, and, uh, which really uh, changed the game uh, the way that we see it and, and see the stock go down. So I don't know, it's, it's junior mining, it's interesting, but uh, we're seeing some valuation in a, in a difficult market, so it does show that uh, the discovery still pays. And as for our register, uh, we have strong uh, management and insider uh, positions. Uh, institutional interest is certainly picking up just in the past uh, really months. Um, B2 Gold uh, have taken on a 9.9% a stake in the company, so we're certainly happy to see that, uh, that stamp of approval on things. Um, and, uh, and Keith Newmeyer was a, uh, a key driver in, in launching the company through an RTO and uh, still holds a significant stake in the company. Uh, we have a strong team uh, behind it, as, uh, as we mentioned. Uh, uh, Tom and Sergio are both here. Our CFO, Matt Roma, Stephanie Hansen uh, makes a, a lot of things that you see happen, uh, happen, and uh, Craig and Sarah are both here as well. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, our management team is uh, young and, uh, and driven, uh, still each very experienced in their respective fields. And uh, I think that what we've been able to do in going from a, a new junior uh, with a, a single drill program two years ago to uh, four drills on five different targets uh, and uh, a 50 person camp with satellite programs is a testament to uh, the amount of horsepower that, uh, that these people and more on our team are, are putting into what we do. We're, we're very serious about uh, building a good company and very serious about uh, exploration and advancement of these targets. And uh, similarly, the board is, uh, is very dedicated, uh, multifaceted, and a really uh, talented group that uh, are available at the drop of a hat to. Uh, to respond to matters. So uh, I think we have a, a really great group and that's allowed us to do a lot of what we've done. And this has also allowed us to do a lot of what we've done. 
Um, and this is just a, a plan map of the valley discovery. And uh, you can see with our drilling this year, all the blue circles are drill results still to come, uh, with the exception of 53 and 54, which we just had out this morning. Uh, but a, a key takeaway from this is just looking at the consistency. Uh, you see, uh, and looking, thinking about the grades of these systems where uh, one gram per ton, you're already uh, kind of uh, in uh, unusual air, rarefied air for, for this kind of a system, what you really see, and then sort of see big continuous zones of one and two and even higher gram per ton uh, that hold together in hole after hole after a large area. It's it just, it's really exciting. And uh, you can make out the topography, the brown lines in the background there. The actual deposit itself is in the bottom of a big, broad, flat valley. So uh, it's uh, really a, a favorable location for exploration as well. And this slide is getting kind of tedious to read, but that's part of the point. If you look through these labels, you just see hole after hole of hundreds of meters of often grams per ton. Um, and it just, uh, it holds together in a, in a very unique and uh, ultimately very mineable way. Uh, it's a cross section, um, so just noting A to A prime there, uh, kind of right through the middle of the thing. But again, this is a cross section, not a long section, uh, and you can see how these grades hold together. You can also see an important feature is the, the way that the uh, strongest grades are right near surface. So, uh, it, you know, again, going back to a, a mining uh, outlook, you're digging into this thing and you have high grade uh, material with basically no internal dilution, uh, almost no strip from day one. Uh, so that means very rapid payback. That has uh, uh, a, a lot of positive implications for the actual economics of, of having a robust uh, operation. And this is just a, a view uh, in 3D of the uh, system. Uh, so actually, you're uh, the first to, to see this. Um, and yeah, this is just a, it gives a better view potentially than the cross section. So uh, while there's no scale bar, you're looking at uh, a, when you look in the, uh, well, um, sort of greater than one gram per ton, you're looking at about 600 meters of, uh, or sorry, for greater than one, uh, five to 600 meters long strike length, uh, more than 400 meters of width. And you can see some of these holes, like that deep one just on the left side of the screen there, uh, kind of coming out of view. Uh, that is hole 39, uh, 553 meters, averaging two and a half grams. Um, and really the, the takeaway here is just how this does hold together. Uh, all, the, all the little, white sticks are holes yet to come. We've done a lot of drilling. Uh, more than half of this season's drilling is still to come. Uh, but what we have seen from, uh, from a few scattered holes that we started the season with uh, to what we've done this year is this deposit has really uh, taken shape or this mineral system that you know, we uh, are quite confident there's a deposit there has really taken shape. Um, and so, yeah, just seeing this grade continuity is, uh, is exceptional, has us excited, and again, the geometry uh, we, we couldn't have designed a better deposit if we had tried. Uh, just for reference, there's a, a picture of the valley itself. Um, and uh, again, you're looking at uh, a very favorable uh, geometry. The, the same structure that caused that valley that some glacier exploited is the same structure that these intrusions exploited in the Cretaceous to, uh, to emplace the valley intrusion. Um, and just a, you know, a bit of uh, a totally unbiased opinion on the uh, on the deposit, uh, Clive Johnson, uh, in, uh, in making the initial investment, uh, just mentioned, well, uh, you can read it as, as uh, probably better than I can, but, um, but yeah, uh, to have uh, to, you know, uh, somebody from a company like B2 come along and, and take, a, take a look and, and call it one of the most significant discoveries in, in Canada in recent history is certainly uh, pretty exciting uh, from our side. Um, and, uh, but it's, again, a, it's sort of a, a designer deposit as far as we see it. It has large tonnage, uh, high grades for this kind of a system. Mineralization is continuous with uh, very little to no internal dilution, uh, low strip, uh, highest grades starting at surface. Our metallurgy is looking really good. We've thrown uh, just off the shelf processes at it with, um, with uh, bottle roll cyanidation, uh, flotation, and CIL. And, uh, and those can come back with average recoveries uh, on a 75 micron grind uh, between 94 and 96 percent, uh, with the, the full range being 90 to 99 percent for those tests. Um, again, the topography works. Uh, it's, uh, it's remote, but it's accessible. We're about 30 kilometers from the Plata mine, which has a heavy equipment winter trail going to it, and you can actually see the mountains that are just uh, by Plata in the background of that picture. So that's the route to, uh, uh, to get to that trail network, um, and no, no big uh, uh, crossings uh, or anything uh, or, or geographical barriers to get there. And uh, again, just for the, the near term, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, news to come. That number has dropped as of this morning, but we're still uh, over 11,400 or something like that. 
Um, the Valley is just part of the picture. We launched the company to look at this as a district. We didn't really know that Valley was there uh, as it is when we started here. And it was the broader geological picture that drew us into the area and work that had been done previously by uh, companies that we'd optioned these claims out to as prospectors uh, during the last gold boom around 2011. And, uh, and the results that they found both on Einerson, on Rogue, uh, and, and on other projects in the area uh, were really phenomenal. And uh, there are a lot of big anomalies in these uh, in these blue stars. And, uh, and so we have a, a lot of work left to do and Valley really serves as a, um, as a proof of concept for this broader regional picture. So we have not lost sight of that. Uh, we certainly uh, um, recognize that we have a, a unique asset uh, held by the tail with, uh, with Valley and, and that's not lost on us, but uh, also not lost on us is the, our idea that this region is very prospective to produce big gold deposits, both reduced intrusion related systems in the case of the rogue target, but also other mineralized systems, uh, you know, that's alive and well. And uh, we've done a lot of work uh, uh, on regional surface work uh, throughout the, our project package. We have over 3000 square kilometers of ground. Um, so it's a, a huge area and, uh, and we've been very aggressive exploring a lot. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's an interesting area. I think it'll continue to evolve uh, as we continue to, uh, to look out there. Uh, so, uh, Near-term catalysts, we're looking again at the, uh, at the results from this year, not just at Valley, but on other targets as well. Uh, we've just finished a, uh, a large diameter uh, PQ core, so we're going into more advanced metallurgical testing, which will help to inform uh, hypothetical mine designs and, and process options and that sort of a thing. So we really uh, can cement our understanding of uh, what this uh, operation uh, could look like. Uh, and of course, we're always, uh, we have our heads down out there and are really looking to uh, uh, to tie things together uh, even further. Um, and uh, just to, I'll close off with a, a picture of the valley outcrop. And this again speaks to not only valley, the mineralization there that you can see the sheeted veins, uh, uh, but uh, the regional picture. This was found by uh, a fellow named Sher Shane Carlos. Um, and uh, just, he was working for Golden Predator at the time. Uh, and he, he spent a lot of time uh, with us this summer working on the regional picture. Uh, but it just shows that you can walk up creeks in this part of the Yukon and, uh, and find things that may be a tier one uh, asset literally sticking out of the ground with no previous description of the mineralization, no claims over the intrusives, not even on a geological map. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a unique uh, set of factors that come together here to have this kind of world-class geology, uh, this kind of perspectivity, and to have it all uh, in one company uh, that's well-financed to go out and look at it. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting to be a part of it. Thank you very much. I think I see my foot in the creek there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, that was a site visit thing. Um, Scott, to what extent, you kind of alluded to in your first statement, to what extent are you a victim of your own success in terms of sequential drill results coming out? Um, yeah, well, you know, like for example, this morning's drill results, uh, they're actually quite substantial in what they do to expanding the southeastern part of the uh, system, but I'm not sure I can, and usually I would know, you know, every number and every sub-interval and that kind of a thing, but it's gone to the point where it's just like, okay, I think Thomas responded to my email, like, oh, another 600 gram meter hole, uh, you know, what do you do? Uh, so it's, it's a, I mean, a good problem to have, but it, but it is a problem if, if people start to fatigue and, and see like, oh, 600 gram meters and that, and, and not really register what that means in terms of building scale. But uh, I think ultimately, you know, whether or not, uh, uh, we can remember the details of every single intersection as we go through it. You know, the model is growing and, uh, and the picture is growing and the, uh, it'll all be encapsulated at the end of the day. A uh, question from the audience, because uh, I want to get to a couple of these. Any thoughts about a resource being published anytime soon? Uh, certainly thoughts. Um, yeah, we're uh, trying not to tie our hands to uh, any uh, firm date on that uh, just yet, uh, but we're uh, obviously looking at data as it comes in and, uh, and figuring out the best course forward. Uh, bismuth to gold and tellurium to gold ratios? Uh, I believe bismuth to gold is around 18 to 1 on average and uh, tellurium, uh, not totally sure, but I think it's uh, around 5. Okay, no, appreciate that. Uh, strategy uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the most, most important goals over the next 12 months for creating value? Um, yeah, so there are a few uh, key goals, and one is uh, continuing to advance Valley, and that's both through exploration. Uh, one thing that we learned uh, from this year's program is that it's bigger than we thought it was, so that's a 
uh, a great problem to have, and there's, there's more work to do uh, in advancing Valley, um, both in, in better delineating high-grade zones and in better delineating the boundaries of the system, uh, and even potentially chasing it at depth in a few key areas. Um, and then uh, beyond just the exploration, though, uh, you know, it, it's pretty clear to us that this is a, a special kind of a discovery. And uh, you know, on those lines, we uh, already started uh, environmental uh, baseline work. Uh, actually, we have a full year now of monthly uh, water quality data and, uh, and continuous hydrology data for, uh, for that stream and, and others in the area to, uh, to do our baseline work. Um, but ex building out on that and doing this metallurgy, doing the more advanced metallurgy, <coughs> doing uh, everything we need to to get a better idea of you know, what this could look like, what the options are uh, for advancing this further beyond exploration. And so, uh, so that's a, a key part of the push. And then, as I mentioned, you know, this is a regional picture, and we have been working hard behind the scenes uh, to, uh, to really advance a, a lot of these targets. And we have a, a very large pipeline of targets uh, at various stages, and, uh, and some are you know, quite promising. And so it's, uh, that's a, a major uh, catalyst to look for in the next year, is if we can uh, build on that regional exploration thesis and uh, not just advance Valley, but you know, find several more of them. Uh, given we have this image up, can you briefly give us the anecdote of the Minister of Natural Resources when he was here, what he said? Uh, sure. So, uh, yeah, um, that's uh, uh, John Stryker and, and our now Premier Ranch Ply were out on site. Um, and John is, uh, is an engineer, um, but, uh, but looking at the, as, the stream, he you know, said, are there any salmon in here? And, uh, and we've actually have done some uh, aquatic work, uh, in environmental DNA and, and so on, and have uh, not found any fish uh, in the stream, let alone salmon. Uh, and so, uh, you know, kind of worried about where this line of questioning is going. He said, uh, no. And, and he looks at it and kind of scratches his chin and, uh, and says, well, you know, I think you could probably pull about a megawatt of power out of here. And so <laughs> he's like, oh, okay, that's great. And, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, technical question from the audience. Is uh, the structural setting of the placement of the valley intrusion the primary driver of its exceptional endowment rather than the specific composition of the intrusion? Sorry, can, and I'll, and can I'll you continue repeat? on. Is it, is it the structural setting or the composition? And then there's no significant, or there is significant endowment or MAC with mm -hmm. no linked intrusion. How much weight would the respective teams give to specific structural components in ranking tombstone Mayo intrusion targets and evaluating the regions around their main deposit? Um, um, well, initially, just looking at, um, you know, uh, I guess structure versus composition in terms of valleys endowment. I would say that the jury's still out, and I would, I would think that there's, you know, it's somewhere on the spectrum in between those answers, and that uh, the structure is, is likely, you know, we are at a structural intersection. I pointed out the big structure running down the valley, and just that's why the valley is there. Uh, there's also a cross-cutting structure that comes in, and, and we're just kind of in the eastern part of that uh, orthogonal intersection between those structures. Uh, but that said, I think that the polyphase nature of valley, there's a, a porphyritic phase that we're seeing at depth. Uh, and that really, uh, the geometry of the grade that's coming into uh, shape this year really suggests that that porphyritic phase is important. And it may be a structural thing that, that allowed, uh, you know, that uh, a fluid to ascend or a magma to ascend that much quicker and form that kind of porphyry texture. And that might have been uh, a key uh, driver. But, uh, but in, in that kind of a scenario, the two, the structural and the, uh, the I guess, textural controls are, are kind of hand in hand. Okay. we're, we're uh done on this phase. Thank you very much, Scott. We're going to have a wrap up next 15, 20 minutes. I think, I think we technically have till 930. It might be, the time might be driven by, I think we'll go to 915 at least, but it might be driven by audience questions too. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go back to the whole group and, and maybe, uh, uh, you know, your single biggest competitive advantage. Who wants to take that first? Okay, Scott, go ahead. Uh, I, I think, uh, as, as I mentioned, we're very early stage, so we're, we're not nearly in the, at the level that these guys are, but we are road accessible. So uh, don't ask me our drill meters cost, because we were just starting up this year, so everything is very high, but we, we do have road access. What's your drill meter cost? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you all, to our total budget uh, was 3.6 million. And okay. we, we fell within that. Uh, we only drilled 3,000 meters, so you can do the math. But in that was Fair all of our staking airborne and, and whatnot on all the properties. I'll give you a number next year. Okay, <laughs> Tara. I would say our location with the exceptional infrastructure we have. Okay. And do you want to, do you want to touch on your First Nations relationships at this point? Uh, 
Sure, you know, we've had ongoing relationships since we, you know, acquired the property, and I've had ongoing relationships with NND for, well, I've got a long history working in the Yukon, you know, 25 mm -hmm. years ago, I was working with all the First Nations in the Yukon, and I actually probably am the only person that got 11 First Nations on side with an agreement that we took to the federal government for fisheries and oceans. Uh, that was a lot of work. There are only 14 uh, First Nations in the Yukon. I only needed the 11 because the mm -hmm. other ones didn't have any alluvial mining in their area. Uh, but that took me two and a half years uh, of really hard work. Um, yeah. But that also established my relationships in communities. And then 12 years ago, I started a charity which, with John, um, working with First Nations and, and schools all across the Yukon. We, we continue to have regular communications about education with every First Nation um, education department across the Yukon. So uh, that combined with actually purchasing a home in Mayo, uh, what was that, seven years ago? Uh, and being present there with our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I know everybody's, I know who's married to who and whose kids are whose, and uh, that means you have a lot of credibility. So yes, there's a new chief in Mayo uh, and new council and- um, Donna Hope. Donna Hope, and I've known her for a long time. You know, she's okay. a great artisan. I've worked with her on things, and yes, I'm gonna work hard to make sure I establish a, a new relationship. We have a meeting. She worked at Hecla as well at one point? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep, she was one of their environmental. Um, okay, staff. great. Tony, competitive advantages? Advantages, I would say there's there's as a two. company. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's one. So our two, but our a our relationship with the native corporation. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're a for-profit billion-dollar entity managing yeah. thir thirteen million acres. Most of that land was picked based on mineral prospectivity. So mm -hmm. we have a, a pipeline, and they cut a check for four million bucks into our company over several different investments. So that's uh, unprecedented. When I go into the communities, like you we know, we're we're holding hands, walking in there. And so that's, uh, that's, that's the, the main competitive advantage. And then I would uh -huh. say the other one is the horsepower under the engine here. Um, I didn't touch upon this earlier, but you know, going into this drill program, we've assembled a team, um, two well-known open pit heat leach engineers, uh, recognized you know, internationally. We brought on three South African structural geologists. And what I'll say to solidify that, our relationship and the talent at the table is that everyone's working pro bono. Uh -huh. um, they've been given options based on KPIs and uh, one of those KPIs. So not is, being uh, paid any salary? Nope, nope. Okay. And our board gets paid nil yeah. right now. That may change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Fair but, enough. But uh, you know, everyone's there for one common goal, and that's to, to find a mine. Okay. Scott, pet advantage? Um, yeah, I think that uh, our, our data set and our land position are a big uh, competitive advantage. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we were prospecting there uh, as far back as 2008, and, uh, and we had huge projects uh, in the area. The, the, precursors to the current uh, project packages that were optioned out to various companies that did a lot of really good baseline work and then that all came back to us in the doldrums of the past decade and uh, and so we've you know we've acquired a, a land position uh, or reacquired a land position based around that quality uh, legwork and that uh, you know a really data focused uh, and and geology focused land acquisition strategy with over 3,000 kilometers now uh, picked up as as a part of that um, and uh, yeah, ultimately, uh, making the discovery that we did in a fairly bad junior market uh, or market for juniors, it led us to uh, be able to sequentially pick up a lot of that land again. And it was, it was uh, actually surprising that there wasn't a big area play. Exactly, exactly. You know, and so that was the shock to me. Yeah. In my experience. So ultimately, we ended up picking up. You know, okay, well, let's just stake the basically the entire rogue plutonic complex and be done with it. And so. Uh, so that's what we did, and you know we've had that kind of uh, flexibility on our other projects too, in, in terms of being just able to iteratively build them out uh, based on data, based on observations. So, so yeah, now that land uh, package and and with a sort of economic or, or market engine like Valley uh, helping to support that exploration uh, on a regional scale as well as advancement of Valley allows us to do that big regional exploration that. Uh, that we would have a hard time doing as a junior otherwise, uh, you know, it, to meaningfully explore that large of a land package yeah. without just blowing ourselves up with dilution. And any questions? I've got a couple questions on text, but just put up your hand if you've got a burning question. Um, Tara, let's talk about some shareholders. You've got a really uh, admirable uh, shareholder franchise with a lot of blue chip funds. Yeah. Maybe just talk a bit about how you attracted them briefly, because uh, you're very institutionalized. Yeah, so back in 2016, it was really hard to uh, get anyone to help you finance. So I had to learn how to finance and build relationships with these funds myself. So, um, you know, a lot of those, um, you know, companies 
have helped us get some of the funds in, uh, specifically, you know, Cormark and PI. Um, but like the most recent uh, deal with Fidelity, that was my relationship. I worked on that uh -huh. for six months uh, to get them in and did a site visit. Um, and okay. really, it, it took a lot of work to get that fund in, whereas some of the others have, have come. Um, but again, it's, it is all about building trust and relationship with funds and showing them the long-term vision that you have. And that's been a more recent addition for you. Scott, can you maybe talk about some of the bigger funds that own uh, Snowline? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, just in the past uh, few months, uh, or you know, this calendar year, um, uh, we've had a, a lot of institutional interest, uh, well, a small amount, but a lot more than uh, basically zero previously. Uh, we had a few funds that invest in early stage uh, projects like uh, Crestcat and, and Commodity Discovery Fund take positions early on, and, and that really allowed us to do what we did uh, in terms of advancing things. Uh, but now, as uh, you know, getting into I guess more of a blue chip exploration story, if you can, uh, if you can say that, um, we're we're seeing uh, groups like 1832 and like Vanek, and even generalist funds like T Rowe Price uh, taking up uh, positions, uh, as well as a fund uh, B2 Gold Corp, uh, who bought a, a position as well. So. Okay, Tony and Scott, I know you guys are a little bit earlier getting institutionalized, but you have the Crestcat endorsement. Any other funds you want to highlight that have come in? Uh, we, we have Gold 2000. We have RCF was our first uh, fund okay. on board. Um, given you know our market cap, we're not necessarily you know inst an institutional product, so you have to really kind yeah. of sift through. Um, but we've been great at attracting family offices and uh, U.S. retail and European retail. So that's uh, been yeah. our go. Okay. Scott? Crestcat would be the main one that kicked us off last year, and we recently financed Adam Zero. Was that 3L, Adam, that uh, led that? Okay. No, great. Um, I didn't, I asked Scott this question, but I want to make sure I get this question in for the other uh, presenters. And it's really, what are the most important goals in order for you to create value over the next 12 months? Let's start with Tara. Okay, well, that's a tough one in this market, but you know, continuing to show that this um, resource is open to growth, really de-risking it. Metallurgy is a real key goal for us, and I think it will be a really important catalyst um, and, uh, and some of our regional results showing that there's additional potential on our property, properties uh, for additional discoveries. You said short, so. Yes, yep. no, that? I like the short answers, <laughs> concise. Uh, Scott, it's value creation, next 12 months. What are the most important goals? Uh, our drill results coming in. Uh, we're okay. expecting those within the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're very encouraged by what we're seeing. Uh, we collect a lot of data. We've had one year looking uh, in the region, so there's lots to pull together and plan for next year. Okay, Tony? Yeah, um, I mentioned we have a three-year plan with every acquisition, so you know, um, to that point, we have obviously drill results that will be coming down the pipeline um, maybe at the end of the year, if not uh, Q1. Um, we have a new project uh, that's on trend, another intrusion target, mm -hmm. which looks very sexy. And uh, that should be announced very soon here. And then in addition to that, metallurgical results. And we're just scratching the surface still. So mm -hmm. that other side of Chicken Mountain, Golden Apex did not get drilled this year. That's the uh, on-trend intrusion there. So those will okay. be the uh, targets for Good. next year's drilling. And back to Scott for his uh, bismuth to gold and tellurium to gold ratios. Which uh, yeah, uh, most importantly, I think we'll be looking at the, the drill core uh, for that. So we've got to wait for those results Say to come in. But uh, the reason we selected these targets was looking at the historical work, particularly the recent work that was done where they were analyzing for bismuth and tellurium, and we did see good correlation there. So we'll, we'll get back to you on those numbers. I'll put okay. them in the press release, Michael. Appreciate that. Uh, questions, I'm going to go to the screen here. Uh, question for Tara, I don't see the strip ratio in your slides. What is the strip ratio and how do the grades look at depth? So uh, this is an inferred resource, and so that was one of the things that sure. um, came up as a question when we updated our resource. We, in our previous resource, we did have a strip ratio uh, published, which was very low. Um, but because there were questions about you know, how this is a very large resource, would you actually mine the whole thing? Uh, QP wasn't comfortable putting a strip ratio in it. So okay. that's a challenge for us, and I think you just need to look at some of the sections to see where the high grade is and really see, you know, similar to, to Scott's, it's mineralization okay. starts right on surface. So yeah. uh, how you mine it will depend on what that strip ratio is. We know Victoria Gold's one-to-one. -one, right, um, right. It's an example. No, it's uh, rapid fire, 10 seconds to answer this question from the audience. Uh, Starting with Scott Castleman, what is everyone's preferred prospecting tool for discovery? 
Ooh, my goodness. Uh, just straight on prospecting. Uh, we've got good exposure. Okay, I like the answer. I get it. Tara? A drill bit. Okay, Tony? <laughs> Drill pit. A smart answer given your project. <laughs> was that a, is that an allowable answer? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, well, in the context of, well, of that mean, project. Yeah, track mounted RC. Okay, Scott? I mean, geochem in an area where things are still poking out of the ground, it's a good vector. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Sue Craig, you had a question, I believe. Do you want me to come back to you in a minute? Yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, what, what are, actually, before I forget, Sarah Weber has has sent me a text to remind everyone that the Yukon Chamber of Mines Geoscience Forum is November 19th to 20th, uh, uh, 22nd, sorry. And uh, there's a capital markets for geologists course on the Friday. Before that, I happen to be one of the presenters. I was the only capital markets individual that went up to the Yukon Geoscience Forum last year. I found a bunch of really good ideas. I had top, my top 10 takeaways. I would encourage anybody to, uh, that is interested in the stocks up there and what's going to happen to go up there. Uh, excellent presentation. It's very technical, but uh, given our orientation, looking for best of breed and highly technical stories, I would encourage everyone to go. So thank you for that reminder, Sarah. Um, what are your biggest challenges? Who wants to start with that? Scott? Um, I think just uh, continuing to. Uh, well, battle with, with uh, assay fatigue, I suppose, is uh, one near-term uh, challenge. You? And then just, uh, yeah, figuring out uh, uh, the, uh, the path ahead, just uh, getting things in place for uh, our baseline work, uh, figuring out, you know, what, that, what options uh, actually look like and, and that sort of a thing, so. Mm -hmm. Tara? I'd say, you know, finding the path forward that not only advances the project the best, but actually is appreciated by this market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't want to spend a whole bunch of money like drilling. You know, it's, we had 10, 20,000 ounces sometimes with holes and Is that something there. you talk to your so board about and try to navigate? Absolutely. absolutely. That's yeah. something that we are doing a whole lot of work right now to look at all the various paths forward and how to add the most value. And, and that in itself is giving us all kinds of great information. So and what's your treasury right now? You said it was nine in working nine. capital? Okay. Scott? Two things that worry me and maybe make me a little bit nervous now are we're uh, renewing our permitting. So I'm a little bit worried about that for next year, although things are going well right now. And the other is uh, now that we're set up, reducing our costs for next year. Okay. Tony? I would say uh, market fatigue. Um, you know, in this market, even when you're winning, you feel like you're losing. So we raised seven and a half million dollars last month in a terrible market. Yeah. And it's still like, what have you done for me lately? So I think our industry's tired and, and uh, well, this is a, like, who would guess we're in a bad market given the audience here, right, at 7 a.m. So, but that's, that's probably- Well, I, I, I would argue that this Tintina Gold Belt on a global basis is uh, being outperforming the rest of the market. I totally agree. And, and uh, I think it is part of this marketing and education that's uh, shining a light on it uh, in, to a greater extent. But uh, I showed the outperformance of the Yukon basket, uh, which is really impressive. And, and whether that continues or not is another question. But I think, I think there's kind of a pan Alaska, Yukon, uh, Northwest Territories uh, play here that's a, a really a new mega province. So I, I really agree with Quentin Hennai that uh, this, this could be a, a really future uh, tremendously endowed region and it's fairly early innings uh, so far. Uh, how's everyone feeling? Any more questions? Andy Brown thinking about a question? Andy Brown. <laughs> oh, which one? Was that the structural one? <laughs> okay, okay, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, which I, which I got, I think. Okay. Anybody else? Didn't Sue have a question? Okay, question here. Just a general question to the participants. Uh, a lot has been said, and I think it's very important, about your relationships with the First Nations. Maybe if everybody could quickly outline what are the main things you're offering to the First Nations and what are the main things you're expecting from the First Nations and your partnership? Okay. Uh, who wants to take that first? I, I can take it. Okay. So what are we offering and what are we expecting? I, I think what we offer is an open ear. So I go into, um, whether it's a corporation or a village, asking, you know, basically listening. Because I think it's actually you're at fault as soon as you assume they need something. 
Um, so that's first and foremost, but ultimately, you know, what motivates them? So understanding, learning, and for the native corporation, they have, you know, in our case, 12 million acres and they want to see a mine. And, um, you know, we're the exploration company to do that. So that's, that's kind of what we're offering. What we're expecting is just support and alignment. And, um, you know, we have that. So we're, we're Scott? happy about that. Um, yeah, no, it's similarly, I think just a, an open ear and an open mind is, is uh, what we can offer at this stage as well as, you know, the um, uh, potential uh, mechanisms to, to work together to, uh, to build value uh, and to build a, a robust community and a healthy community um, just based on having economic resources and economic independence. So uh, that's taken shape in, uh, you know, we've been sitting down, for example, with the uh, the development corporation of the Nacho Nayak Dun. Uh, I, I was personally even before launching the company um, and looking about options and you know how we might structure things and um, and and a lot of good has come out of that. For example, our, our camp is is powered by a, a 27 kilowatt solar generator uh, that is a huge capex for an early stage junior. But uh, we were able to work out a, a lease arrangement with the uh, with the DevCorp and they've launched a renewable energy company based on the success of that project and and it actually. Uh, serves our, our project extremely well. Um, what we expect from the First Nation, uh, it's, it, I, I don't think we have expectations. I mean, we just, uh, you know, we hope that we can uh, build that kind of value and we hope that we can uh, uh, engage in a meaningful way that allows us to address uh, concerns and identify opportunities. Do you want to touch on the fact that you're on the Nacho Naya Dun territory, but you're going to be coming to the south once the project's developed onto the Ross River Casca? Yeah, um, so that's, uh, we also have uh, had a lot of uh, conversations with the uh, Ross River Dena Council, uh, as well as their development corporation. And so that's, uh, it's a likely access corridor. It's not necessarily the only access corridor, uh, but, uh, but the, you know, the nearest road is, is 75 kilometers away from Valley, and, uh, and that's uh, within uh, Ross River traditional territory as well, um, as are some of our projects. And so, um, so a similar uh, arrangement there where we're uh, just, it's, it's early stages and, and we've had uh, ongoing conversations for, for a long time, just trying to keep them uh, appraised of what we're doing and trying to understand uh, how we can, uh, you know, what, uh, what mutually beneficial advancement uh, looks like there. And it's a similar situation, for example, to uh, uh, what Predium had, uh, as I understand it, with, uh, with their Bruce Jack uh, being in tall 10, uh, traditional territory, but then having an access corridor coming through Niska. So yep. um, yeah, it's certainly not unprecedented. So Terry, you've partially answered this question already, yeah. but do you want to give a little bit more personal anecdote in terms of the new chief, uh, oh, Donna Hope? Yeah, no, she's, um, well, she's quite an artisan and, and you know, I've known her for, for numerous years, but, but I think I do want to answer your, your main question about, yeah. you know, we have been having regular communications, both with chief and council and lands, uh, from when we took over the property because the first uh -huh. thing we had to do was permit it and so we really had to go and listen and understand the concerns and that's actually part of the basis of of what we've done in our baseline work and and why we focused on that so you know we have a very regular pattern you know we go before we send in our preseason report we make sure that they comment on it we we later have a meeting with chief and council and lands together uh, and then in the fall we have another one and then we when we have our postseason report, you know, we so we have very regular communication is, is what one of the main things that we're offering. And again, listening and trying to make sure that we're coming back with not what we want to tell them, but what they want to hear, uh, which does change. Okay. And so that that's been really important, I think. Um, the other really important thing that my team does very well is we hire and train from the community. And we have very individual schedules, which helps to get community members. We thought with Heckla and Victoria, we'd never be able to get people from the community because you know they pay more they you know it's got the prestige and um, but we've been tremendously successful and we have lots of long-term employees and it's because of how dedicated my my managers are to actually and to training and people talk about that but when you actually do it and you have to actually say okay what are you why can't you come to work and uh, and that's a real benefit because we're road accessible you know I got to go because I got to go hunting or I've got child care or this that and the other it, it gives us that opportunity and, and we go above and beyond in that and I think that's very much recognized in the community um, and we have long-term people that work for us because of that okay great I, I'm going to ask Scott to answer the question, and then unless there's any questions from the audience, we'll probably wrap up, give each uh, presenter about a minute 
uh, to wrap it up with final closing comments. Okay, unless I see questions in the audience right after Scott uh, answers the question um, that you, you already mentioned, you've got a yep. bit of a juggling act with the number of First Nations. Yeah, so for this year, we used a, a local consulting company uh, from the Yukon Archer Cathro to manage our camp and provide a lot of the services. Their First Nation employment was greater than 50% on our project, so that was great. Mm -hmm. We use uh, Ross River suppliers for fuel and our rock cut lumber. Um, and then on the Northwest Territories uh, side, we had two uh, hirees from the community of Tulita, and we also assisted a prospector from Tulita who was prospecting in our area with helicopter access and, and so on. So we're an earlier stage, not quite at the, at the level of uh, engagement with the First Nations. Okay, sounds like you're all on your front foot yeah. in, in terms of that. And I want to acknowledge there are other derivatives. Sitka's got a table here uh, <coughs> producing really good results. Uh, Core and, and Mike and team. Uh, I don't know if anybody from Onyx is here, but I, when I agreed to do this, because that was a spin out of High Gold, I said I've, I've got to mention Onyx. So um, anybody from Onyx here, I've done my job on that front. <laughs> but let's, let's go for the wrap up one minute uh, pitching this, this group on uh, you know, why Tectonic to start. <laughs> if you didn't get it by now, um, <laughs> yes. um, I think I think the the takeaway is that we're just we're passionate. Uh, we're here to find a mine. We engage early. We got alignment from the local um, First Nations communities, and uh, this project would not be like High Gold. Actually, it was tucked on a shelf um, to walk yep. into a place that has 55 drill holes, uh, visibility for a million ounce resource already, and we're the first ones to touch it in 20 plus years. Uh, stay tuned, it's gonna be exciting. And we have structural geologists, Andy. So we're, we're all about structure, and that plays a huge role in this project. You got another 40 seconds. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike Gray. Yeah, we need more <laughs> of this. And I'm not just saying that to put uh, pump air in your tires. And, and I wanna thank everyone for taking time. As bad as the market is, this is great. This is what our industry is all about. It's about the people. And it's great to uh, keep those connections and relationships alive and having people wave the flag for us. Uh, exploration is out there. Okay. Thank no, you. thank you. That's 45 seconds. Amazing, Tony. How can I have 15? <laughs> uh, Scott. Scott. Uh, so we are very excited about our project. We've got one year of exploration in the belt. We really liked what we saw. Uh, I think you could probably tell from the pictures of core that we think we have a reduced intrusion, a couple of reduced intrusion related gold systems in, in a couple of those intrusions uh, to the point where we decided to exercise three options and make payments on those uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We want to get out there and are looking forward to work in them next year, and we look forward to the, uh, putting out our drill results here in a couple of weeks. You got 30 seconds. 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> okay. No, I think, I think that's about Okay, it. fair enough. Uh, Tara, if you want to close, and also there was one question I missed. Uh, someone wanted to know a little bit about grassroots targets, other regional targets that you might or might not pursue. Okay, you want me to put that all in one there? Okay, yeah, you, so yeah. grassroots, yeah, our nitro property, there's lots of historic placer mining on that property, both are historic and active. So those are some of our targets combined with some structural and geophysical targets over there. A gold Dome, which was just purchased by Victoria Gold, where there is a known intrusive gold deposit, uh, is right on the edge. We've got some targets around that. And then, uh, you know, there's pl placer mining around the main Ormac property as well. So. Um, Stay tuned, you know, we did early okay. stayed work on that. Uh, why Banyan? Yep. We've got an exceptional resource. We already have 6.2 million ounces, and yes, I can see a view to eight, maybe even 10 uh, there. I think the potential's there uh, with continued drilling. Uh, that's exceptional. With our infrastructure in a jurisdiction where you can permit uh, one First Nation that's a settled First Nation, which already has agreements. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a very exciting time for Banyan, and you know we're de-risking it with the metallurgical work that we're doing, some high-level engineering. Um, you know we could execute on a PPA very quickly if we thought that would would add value. Um, and I think uh, you know I think gold is starting to get a little bit of attention, and certainly within jurisdictions where you can permit and develop. Okay, Scott. Um, yeah, I think really just the uh, three key messages for uh, for snow mine are one is just value is a unique and exceptional discovery, and I think that uh, I, you know similar to what Tara was saying, uh, it's it's straightforward compared to a lot of gold systems to uh, to piece it together, even from just looking at the results and the uh, region or like the area that uh, they're coming from so far. Uh, it has so many favorable attributes, and uh, it looks to be something of the scale that could really be uh, 
industry leading in the in the development pipeline of, of projects out there. Uh, and the second is uh, is the regional picture. Again, we we didn't form the company to find value. We formed the company to explore that area, thinking that it was a prospective patch of ground, and so to find value in it right out of the gate. Uh, as well as some of the other uh, early exploration successes that we've had is truly encouraging in that vein. And the third is, uh, is Snowline itself, the team that has come together behind the company. And uh, we have a really hardworking group and uh, with, uh, with, with common alignment, common goals, and uh, working hard to, to build a new kind of company that uh, really brings true value to shareholders and to the Yukon. Very good. Please join me in thanking our presenters.